Have you ever looked around and just wanted to be like someone else? The first time I took a public speaking class, I was nine years old. <laughs> and there was this 11-year-old girl, Allison, who was just so cool. I was the nice, quiet, studious kid who helped out the teachers. So yeah, I was pretty cool too. For our final, we had to make these how-to speeches, and I chose to talk about how to make these peanut butter balls out of peanut butter, corn flakes, corn starch, and raisins. And when I sat down, I remember shaking with nerves and just hoping that no one could tell how mortified I felt. And then Allison got up there. To this day, I remember her getting a standing ovation while I was covered in peanut butter. And I thought, I just want to be like her. I'm here today to talk to you about what it takes to develop our voices, how education plays a role, and why it is important to feel safe, brave, and ultimately free. While the desire to be like someone else can be a useful starting point, we have to learn how to speak for ourselves. I've always been surrounded by powerful voices and just fascinated by how people develop them. I'm Filipino-American, which in my family meant that we sang in church and once spent eight hours singing karaoke, which we recorded on CDs and handed out to all our family members. I could sing on a stage, but public speaking was a totally different story. I remember just spending hours on classroom presentations, trying to get it exactly right, and then feeling so sweaty and just thinking about all the things that I forgot to say. I wanted to feel comfortable and just be me. That didn't really seem possible after that peanut butter ball speech, but a couple of years later, some high school students came to visit my middle school class to demonstrate the 17 different forms of speech and debate that I could do, and my friend begged me to join the debate camp. Debate camp was full of all the kids that I wanted to be like, especially this one guy, Aaron, who was a year above me. Aaron was one of the best debaters in the country, and he was incredible. He not only crushed his opponents, but he also spent time with novices like me, helping us write speeches and analyze topics. In discussions, he always had the perfect answer for every question, and even every question just made us think about things differently. I remember during one practice, writing in my notebook, learn how to ask questions. For me, public speaking started by watching people like Aaron speak, and then doing a lot of different forms of speech and debate and going to tournaments. I spent the first two years losing debate rounds, but that just made me want it more. I guess you could say that I was running away from discomfort, chasing the feeling of being free. I spent every year going to 10 to 15 different tournaments and spending about 80 rounds of competition every year. I finally hit my stride after two years and started going undefeated and going to state and national championships. I couldn't afford the activity financially, and our team didn't have any funding, so my church raised money for my travel, and my coach, Mrs. Berman, paid for my fees, saying that I could pay her back one day. She passed away before I could. I have since spent my entire career as an educator trying to create the same kind of safe environment that I had. I went back to my high school as a volunteer speech and debate coach, trying to be someone else's Aaron or Mrs. Berman and pay it forward. I even did research on speech and debate, just trying to understand why students with invisible disabilities felt really comfortable and smart in the debate team environment, but felt marginalized in the classroom environment. Every job I held after that as a professor involved some form of voice, whether it was helping first-year teachers facilitate classroom discussions or helping undergraduates learn public speaking. And then I started my nonprofit, The Practice Space, which elevates underrepresented voices through public speaking education, helping people of all ages feel confident through storytelling, presentation, and debate. Oh boy, did I feel seen the first time that I learned how people learn, otherwise known as the learning sciences. It was like my entire journey as a speaker was there in every article that I read. It turns out that observation and social and cultural context play an important role in learning, just like when I watched Aaron speak and why it was so important to be part of a supportive team environment. When we learn something new, you have to be able to apply it to different contexts and reflect on how it's going. 
which is just what I did during tournaments and what my students do now. The most eye-opening research was this research called the How People Learn Reports by the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine, which tell us that we have more motivation to persevere when we see a connection between what we are doing now and who we want to be in the future. In other words, we need to be able to see what we are doing as valuable. And on top of all of, all of that, we have to believe that we can achieve our goals, otherwise known as self-efficacy. But we can't do any of this if we don't feel safe. There's this wonderful quote from the research team out of Stanford University, led by the late Dorothy Steele and her colleagues, Becky Con Vargas and team, which states, in an identity safe environment, you are not invisible and you do not have to leave a part of yourself at the door to feel a sense of belonging. You can be yourself just as you are and thrive in the world. When I coach public speaking, I start with identity safety. I start with who someone is and what they want for themselves. I create opportunities for goal setting and choice and leadership and even opportunities to fail with guidance because that makes them feel safe to be who they are. And in turn, when I coach public speaking, I feel safe to be myself. Unfortunately, too many people in this world do not feel this way and have never felt this way throughout history. Silencing is driven by institutionalized oppression and taught through everyday encounters. For many BIPOC people, the world is a dangerous place full of prejudice, discrimination, and stereotype threat. How can you feel safe to try if the world is so high stakes and scary? Even our classrooms are unsafe and students are punished and treated differently along racial lines or the content doesn't reflect who they are or worse, tells a contradictory narrative. Even if you aren't directly harmed, there is harm in not being represented. Filipino Americans are the second largest Asian ethnic group in the United States, and yet their stories are, remain invisible and largely untold in mainstream media and history books. Even Filipinos sometimes can participate in our own internalized oppression, promoting skin lightening products or telling their kids not to get too dark in the sun and holding up whiteness as a model. As a mixed race person myself, it was hard to look around and see where I was reflected in the world. It was hard to figure out who I wanted to be. Joining speech and debate was powerful for me because I finally had a template to tell me who I wanted to be, to be able to point to something and say, yes, that, that's what I want. I wanna talk a little bit more about templates and the role that templates and even artificial intelligence can play, but how it can only take us so far. The word template means a mold or a pattern or a guide that helps us produce or do something. It can be a mold made out of metal or wood that helps guide mechanical design. It can be a guide that helps us plan or teach a lesson. It can even be a pattern to help us design a dress. When we're learning something new, we have to have a template. It's almost like a coloring book page that helps us figure out where to add our own special touch. But at the same time, we have to be able to figure out who we want to be. When I was in speech and debate, I had a template for everything, from writing opening speeches to researching and even how to shift my tone of voice for maximum impact. There was even a template for what to wear, and I proudly wore my blazer and my high heels. And years later, when it came to academic conferences or work presentations, it was so familiar because it was the exact same template as debate. That template made me feel confident because I knew what to do. How many of you have had a template that helped you know what to do? Fast forward to 2016 when I decided to pursue a dream of mine that I had had ever since I was seven years old and I saw The Little Mermaid for the first time. I wanted to take a voiceover acting class. You'd think with all that public speaking experience that it would come naturally, but I was shocked when I heard my presentations played back and they were safe and just so boring. And as the instructors said, middle of the road. The voices that stood out were the ones that were rough around the edges, quirky, weird, one of a kind. They broke the template. That experience was such an important reminder to me to break my life's template and take a different path and find my own original voice. So I went all in and the next year I started my nonprofit and as hard and as scary as it was, 
It was so worth it. I see the same thing with my students at the practice space. Last month, I was working with this wonderful high school student, a beautiful girl with a powerful story about coming to America from Nigeria and how people look down on people from third world countries. I asked her about a, spe a recent speech tournament, and she said, well, I learned I have to change everything. I said, why? She said, well, I'm doing it wrong. After some digging, she finally said, there was this girl in one of my rounds, and she said that I was breaking the rules. Looking at her correct, revised, templated speech made me sad. All of her personal stories were gone, replaced by facts and information that reminded me of every single different speech that I had seen in competition. She mastered the template, but as I said to her, now it's missing you. While a template can be a helpful starting place, they can also teach us that our life experiences, voices, and identities are somehow unimportant, unworthy, or wrong. They can be inherently inequitable and designed to shut some people down. Why did speaking the correct way mean eliminating your own personal story? Why, for me, did dressing professionally mean wearing a blazer or high heels? Internalized oppression can happen when we start to believe that the template is better than our own choices. At the practice space, the most fearless students are the eight-year-olds. And when we work with adults, I see so many women who just want to sound more professional. They want to sound less emotional. They want to not say um. They want to lose their accents. They talk about feeling like an imposter. More and more, I see people get excited about tools like ChatGPT because it puts words and ideas together better than they ever could. Artificial intelligence doesn't stumble. It doesn't have doubts. It doesn't feel like an imposter. But the rise of artificial intelligence tools tells us that we need to take the time to reflect on why we are using those tools. It's one thing to want to have a template and learn something new because we should embrace tools that help us learn. But it's another thing entirely when we actually use those tools to sidestep learning, avoid productive challenge, or worse, when we lose our authenticity because we would rather be perfect than real. Unfortunately, in education, we love trying to get the answers right. And unfortunately, that actually encourages templating rather than bravery. We also live in a world that ultimately rewards original thought but usually only for an elite few with privilege and power. If we want to be able to have young people at the center of education, then we need access to opportunities to develop our voices. I believe that public speaking can be a lever for equity. We saw this with the powerful youth activists in Parkland, Florida. Before the 2018 mass shooting took place, these youth participated in the only countywide initiative in the United States that required speech and debate for elementary schools, middle schools, and high schools. When that terrible tragedy took place, they were ready. They were ready. In too many schools today, students are only assessed on being able to regurgitate information that they learn in classes and texts. It comes as no surprise that these same assessments are vulnerable to artificial intelligence. There's a template to the five-paragraph essay and to the college personal statement. So if what we're trying to assess is the template, then why not let a robot do it for you? But if what we're trying to assess is original thought, then we have to speak. We need more oral assessments, presentations, and debates to engage in what we really think and feel but we also need to be able to facilitate diverse expression. My colleagues and I at the practice space call this expression-driven teaching, which at its core is the idea that we need to facilitate diverse expression and thought through public speaking, where people can feel free and brave to be themselves on purpose. Public speaking is more than a vital skill. It is a key to liberation, because that's how we can engage in dialogue, explain and defend our thinking, and even struggle productively to learn. And it's not gonna be easy. So where should we get started when it comes to developing our own free, original voices? Identity, commitment, and connection. First, identity. 
Being a good public speaker starts with putting yourself out there and being who you are. It's hard to figure out what that is sometimes and how you fit or don't fit in with existing templates. So it helps to have a coach that can see you for who you are and help you experiment with what you put out there in the world. Number two, commitment. When figuring out what to say, ask yourself, what's the one thing that matters most to you? Too many people put way too much attention on what to do with their hands or how not to say um, but actually we should spend our time trying to figure out what we are trying to say, and then those filler words just slip away. Public speaking should start with your content. And number three, connection. Communication is all about connection. It's not just about putting yourself out there, but you actually have to resonate with people. <laughs> and there are moves that you can do to help resonate with your listeners, such as using hand gestures or examples to illustrate your point, or even pausing every once in a while to hear their point of view. Those moves shouldn't be about in trying to impress your listener, but trying to resonate with them. What drives all of this is choice. Choice to be who you are, choices about your main idea, and choices about what to do to resonate with your listeners. At an institutional level, we can teach choice through oral literacy across the curriculum that allow young people to learn how to make their own choices. At an interpersonal level, we need facilitators who can create the conditions for identity safety and expression-driven teaching. And at an individual level, ask yourself, what is the one thing that matters most to you? And what can you do to help it resonate with your listeners? I have a confession to make. I've used a lot of templates here today, and the TED template's pretty useful. But at the end of the day, what I really want to do is be like my students. I want to be like Stella, because she has a unique style that just captivates the audience. I want to be like Elohim because he is one of the strongest youth coaches I have ever met. I want to be like DeAndre because he can give insightful analysis on the spot. And Jemima and Julia, who are bold, original writers. And I want to be like Mistura because she can take her vulnerability and turn it into something creative and beautiful. What I want to leave you with today is this. Speak for yourself. The ultimate goal should be to feel free. Free to put yourself out there and have it resonate with even one other person. Learning how to use your voice is hard, and not everyone's going to agree with you. But the alternative of allowing other people to speak for you is unthinkable. Sometimes we have to do something uncomfortable if it expresses our identity. Sometimes we have to break the template. So. I'll take the first step and hope you join me. Thank you.